Okay, and now let's just start this nice and clean so it looks like a decent video when this is all done. Welcome. Uh, tonight we are going to learn how to train for a backpacking trip. There are lots of different components to this, so we're going to try and break it down and then make your life as easy as possible. And hopefully you can enjoy your pack packing trip instead of destroying your body. So, all right, we are all good. So there's a few things. Oh, we need a new sheet here. So when you're training for a backpacking trip, there are three factors that I'm primarily looking at as far as training goes. The first one is durability and strength because when you're backpacking, typically what happens is you have a little issue with your knee or maybe something with your ankle or maybe your back gets sore, all these little things that kind of disrupt your ability to actually have a good time. So we need to make sure your body actually holds up and stays together so that you don't destroy yourself. Um, We'll talk more, more at length than this. You also need some endurance. Most of the time people consider endurance the number one uh, aspect, but I put it number two just because I think, you know, if you have a bad knee, you can have all the endurance in the world, but that knee isn't gonna make it out and you can't really use it. You know, you can't really use your endurance if your knee is down. So endurance number two, we'll talk about how you can uh, train for that. And then body composition. So. Again, I was going to teach this at REI, so if you aren't in my class and you're here, I'm going to break down this body composition. If you are in my class, this might be a little repetitive for you, but um, just bear with me. Uh, when I talk about body composition, the reason why I think it's important to address with backpacking is because you're going to be adding additional weight to your body in a backpack. And you might be adding 30 pounds, some people go up to 50 pounds, which, I mean, in my opinion, you should pack lighter, depending on how long you're going. But if you're carrying excess body weight plus a backpack, that's going, going to cause, uh, it's just not going to make your life as good. It's going to cause some problems. So if you are carrying extra weight, um, we can look at this body fat wise or BMI wise, uh, you want to slim down a little bit so that you're not doing more work than you have to. So let's say, for instance, um, and I haven't done a body composition on you, obviously. You can do those uh, in the lab. Obviously, the performance lab is closed right now, but I did put a link in the description if you are interested. But we can do body fat testing to see how much lean mass you have and how much fat mass you have. And based on that number, we can tell you if you're healthy, if you need to lose some weight, if you need to gain some weight, because you need a certain amount of fat mass. So when we're looking at body fat, um, if you needed to lose, let's say, let's say you had 40 pounds to lose. Well, that's your backpack. So you could start working and losing that body fat, and then when you throw your backpack on, you're just the same weight that you used to be. Uh, so, you know. If you have an additional 40 pounds, additional 50 pounds of excess fat that you're carrying, plus a 30 pound backpack, you're carrying 70 pounds. That is a lot to carry. So when we are looking at this, uh, a lot of people know their BMI or they've heard of BMI. This is just a ratio of height or weight over height in kilograms over meters squared. You can calculate your own if you want. There's lots of calculators online. The healthy range is between 18 and 25, but this isn't the best measure because if you have a lot of body fat, I mean, if you have a lot of muscle mass, this will oftentimes tell you that you're overweight. So I would be aware of the BMI uh, measurement, but body fat, I have a chart right here that shows you if you're healthy or not. You may not know because you would have to get some kind of test. They have scales, they got calipers at the performance lab, which is where I work. We have uh, a bod pod and an underwater measurement. Those are the two most accurate. So, um, you know, if you don't know where you're at, that would be something that you could look into potentially. Let's get back here. So just think of that about that with the backpack on. Uh, this is kind of a long-term training form, but it's also going to be healthy for you to be a healthy weight overall. So again, make sure you don't get too light because that's just going to make um, you less healthy. So, okay, let's uh, talk about endurance next, I think. So endurance is fairly important, and we have a few components. And... Uh, I'll be answering the questions in a little bit because I get distracted if I look over there too much. So when we're thinking about endurance, you get a few components here that are important to train. We got VO2 max and we got lactic threshold. So VO2 max is how much oxygen your body can consume. And this number is actually fairly genetic. So if you have a high VO2 max, you can thank your parents. You might not know what your VO2 max is. We can actually test that in the lab as well. In my opinion, it's not necessary to get it tested, but you know, your Olympic endurance athletes, males are going to be up in the 80s um, for the VO2 max, and that's milli milliliters per kilogram per minute. 
basically it's a measurement of how much oxygen your body can consume. And the more oxygen your body can consume, the more fat you can turn into energy. So that's why VO2 max is somewhat important and that's why it makes really good endurance runners. And so if you're out on you know, a hike, you actually, if you have a high VO2 max, it's gonna help you out because you're gonna be able to, to, to convert more, um, more fat with that oxygen into energy and you're also gonna be able to work harder. So not the most important thing, you can be a really good backpacker and have a low VO2 max because this is kind of your maximal workload. So there are very few times when you're actually reaching your max when you're hiking, but it does help to have a high max. So now let's look at lactic threshold. Lactic threshold is kind of your ability to use your, um, or it's kind of, it's your best marker of fitness, I would say. It's your ability to use your VO2 max. So the way I describe this, I'm going to draw a glass here. So this glass represents your physiological capabilities. And let's say, so this is your VO2 max. Your VO2 max actually increases by about 10%, but there is a genetic ceiling. So you can only improve it so much. All right, and your lactic threshold naturally is about somewhere between 50 to 60% of your VO2 max. This is your lactic threshold, VO2. So what this means is you can have as high a VO2 max as you want, but if your lactic threshold is right here, this is kind of how hard you can work for an extended period of time. What happens is when you are exercising, you are using carbohydrates and fat, but the more intense your exercise is, you're using more carbohydrates, and you start to produce lactic acid, hydrogen ions, a bunch of metabolites, and that buildup of metabolites can interfere with fat uh, breakdown. It can eventually lead to fatigue um, as you're using your carb stores. So what we want to do is we want to increase your lactic threshold as high as we can get it. So if we can increase your lactic threshold up to here, now you have all of this area that you can use to actually you know, put forth effort. So the way we train lactic threshold is with HIIT training, high intensity interval training. And this basically means that you're going hard, so you're spiking your heart rate for a period of time. It could be 30 seconds, it could be, um, well, however long, right? It could be five minutes, that's, that's quite long, but you can go up to five minutes, even maybe even longer, but typically 30 seconds to five minutes, I'd say even down to two minutes, that's 30 seconds to two minutes, two minutes is probably the general range. So I'm going to show you a workout here, but first when we're doing these HIIT workouts, we want to be uh, keeping in mind this rate of perceived exertion. So you need to be working hard enough for these HIIT workouts to actually be a benefit to you. And if you see this chart, a 7 out of 10 or higher is going to be getting you above that lactic threshold, so you're going to be getting benefit from it. So uh, I would look at the, the speech section that you see there. And for a seven, it says you can only speak in broken sentences. So you should be working hard enough to where you can't just talk in a sentence. And that's kind of a good indicator of where you're at on your lactic threshold. You can also just think about it in terms of, you know, how hard do I feel like I'm going? It turns out people are really good at saying, yeah, I'm at a seven out of a 10. So if we're going to make a HIIT training workout here, it's pretty easy. You always want to do a warm up, five, 10 minutes, get a light sweat going, nothing fancy. And then, my classic one that I like to start out at when I haven't been working out is 30 seconds hard and 30 seconds easy. And then I just do that times six. So when I'm only doing 30 seconds, I'm probably at a nine out of 10. But if I'm just starting, I'll start out at a seven out of 10. And as you get more fit, you can increase the number of reps. You can maybe decrease this, the rest. You can increase the amount over here. So you could have a two minute hard boot with uh, one minute easy or off as I call it sometimes um, you know and you can do that times eight you can get as creative as you want you can do this on a bike you can do this while you're hiking even if you find a hill you can hike up it running uh, biking ellipticaling whatever you want to do so as long as you're getting your heart rate up there as long as you're working hard and then you're recovering and then working hard again we just want to spike that heart rate over and over so that's kind of how we improve our lactic threshold and that also improves our VO2 max so we just want that intensity. When it comes to specific training for a backpacking trip, this is actually getting out and backpacking. So you don't have to start with a pack right away. Part of it is just getting used to walking on une uneven footing, trails, hills, all that stuff. So I would make sure that you're doing some of that kind of out in the open. Um, 
as you progress, you want to slowly increase the weight that you're carrying if you are carrying a backpack because just the act of walking or running or anything where you're on your feet is going to start to toughen up and make your feet and limbs and ankles more durable. Uh, for instance, I just started running again. I was getting lazy and I'm pretty sore from that even though I didn't lift or anything. So just doing this easy kind of stuff is going to start building a good base for you. And then one other thing to mention on here is that consistency is super important when we're talking about endurance training. So what you have and what you are training partially is your mitochondria. So you have mitodensity here and they are the powerhouse of the cell. They help break down your uh, fat and use it as fuel. And so what happens is it takes you about four weeks to really build up your mitochondria. And the density kind of goes like this. The more mitochondria you have, the, the more energy you're going to be able to utilize. So let's say this is week four right here. And then let's say you get lazy and you take one week off. So this is week five. What's going to happen is if you take a week off from cardio training, you're going to lose about half of your mitochondria particularly if you're training at a high level. So we want to make sure that we're doing some type of cardio at least every two days, um, at least every three. So you want to be doing three, two, three days a week. You know, if you exercise Monday, Tuesday, and then you take the rest of the week off, you're going to start to see a dip. But the less time you take off, you're, you know, maybe going to recover quicker. So you just want to make sure you're consistent with that cardio. Let me uh, check out the questions real quick, and then we'll go on to durability and strength. So, uh, what exercises or things can you do to train for elevation differences? Let me know. Okay, so for elevation, yeah. So, when you're, a lot of times you're hiking in the mountains for this, and what's different about altitude is that there's less pressure, so there's less oxygen getting into your muscles. And so, these are going to really help you here because if your overall fitness is higher, the amount that that altitude is going to affect you is going to be a lot lower. Uh, some people do altitude training. Really what you need to do for that is you need to sleep above five or 6,000 feet for about three weeks. And what that does is it actually tricks your body. It makes your body think that it's actually losing blood mass because the pressure is lower. And so it's going to hyperproduce your uh, hemoglobin. And that's what carries our oxygen. And so it actually boosts our fitness by being at altitude for at least sleeping there for three weeks. So for most of us, that's not a reasonable thing. Um, but when we get to nutrition, I'll talk about that because taking in sugar when you're at altitude actually really improves performance because you're getting less oxygen, so you're not able to utilize fat as much. So drinking a little bit of sugar as you hike, and I'll set some recommendations for that at the end, um, is going to be one of the ways you can combat that altitude. So good question. All right, what other questions do we have? For those that may not have a high VO2 max, what would they need to do to compromise that? So if you're talking about trying to improve it, this HIIT training is going to be improving all of that. And most people have plenty VO2 max in order to hike because the, the real key here and the reason why I would suggest that improving your VO2 max is going to be important is because let's say you are trying to get over a pass, a mountain pass, and there's a storm closing in. Uh, you might need to get up that mountain pass as quick as possible and the higher your VO2 max is, theoretically, the quicker you're going to be able to get yourself out of that dangerous situation. So if uh, for some people, lots of people's VO2 max is 40, like you can still, or not 40 kilograms, 40 milliliters per kilogram per minute. With this type of VO2 max, you're not going to be a track star probably, but you're rarely using all of this when you're backpacking. So so VO2 max isn't the most important thing, I would say. I would say you can get a lot more out of the weight room because most people have muscle fatigue that slows them down rather than they're working so hard they can't work any harder. But this VO2 max and this intensity is going to allow you to um, get yourself out of situations that you don't want to spend a whole lot of time in. Um, so, yeah, so for training, it's just high intensity is going to be your best way to improve VO2 max and lactic threshold. And you want both of those as high as they can be. And you really only need HIIT training two times a week. So two times a week. Okay, good. Good questions. What is the best elevation to train at for getting used to climbing big elevation changes? I've heard that if you speak, sing, and running, you can improve your cardio. Yeah, so I, I'm not buying into that kind of stuff. Um, so when you're training at altitude, 
you're not getting a whole lot of benefit from actually exercising at altitude. I think there is some benefits, but they haven't been able to measure them very well. And so the way I like to think about that is at altitude, you're going to be burning a higher amount of fat. So it could help with weight loss and it could increase your body's ability to break down fat. Uh, but unfortunately, there's this thing called this lac the lactate paradox. And at altitude, you're not able to spike your lactic acid, or your, your lactic, your lactic acid um, super high. And there's some theories, but nobody can quite figure out exactly why. Uh, but it appears that when you're at altitude, your body doesn't want to use carbohydrates as much because it knows you're in a low oxygen environment, so it's holding on to calories or something like that. And so it's hard to spike your lactic threshold when you're at altitude. So if you are going to altitude, I would suggest doing like easier, longer, slower type activities. And then when you're down in Boise, that's where I am, or down at a lower level, Lower, lower altitude uh, to do those high intensity workouts down there because you can produce a lot more lactic acid and that is what's going to increase here. But um, who knows? There could be, there's a reason for it. We just haven't figured it out yet. So, um, yep, good questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then the singing, speaking, that's just going to tire, tire you out more. In my opinion, it's unnecessary. Uh, you know, you're just making your life harder and I would rather run faster than sing and slow myself down. So what kind of diet would be best for this type of training? High carb, keto, etc. cetera. Um, save that for nutrition. Um, I'm going to talk about nutrition at the end and then uh, re-ask if I forget to do that. So, all right, good. Now let's go on to durability and strength. So I think this is one of the most overlooked and most important aspects of this. So when we're thinking about durability and strength, you got muscles, tendons, bones, ligaments, all these things, if you have one little issue with those, it's going to make your life not as good, right? If you pull a hamstring or, you know, your muscles are just really sore, tired, weak, you're not going to be able to do very much work. If you injure a tendon or a ligament, uh, you know, bone, knees and ankles are really kind of at risk here. And then bones, obviously, if you break a bone, that's not going to be good. So any type of resistance training, which is just moving something heavier than what you move in your normal life, is going to increase your muscle strength, your tendon strength, your ligament strength, and your bone strength. So the reason why, and bones, people don't really realize this, but what happens with your bones is, let's say you're doing bicep curls, your muscles and ligaments and tendons are actually pulling on the bone and adding stress to that, and then it grows back stronger. So we really want to make sure that we're durable to get to these hikes, because if you, you know, tear some ligament, 30 miles into the backcountry, you're not going to have a good time. So we want to make sure that you're prepared for that. So just a general workout here for people. Uh, since we're under quarantine, I didn't do any weight room workouts. But uh, we got a bunch of the important muscle groups that I think are important to train. And then we have some exercises. So obviously, you need strong legs if you're going to do a backpacking trip. So I like lunges and squats. Again, you're just improving your overall strength, and that's even some hip work there. I actually put glutes and hips down here. So you can do some hip circles, which is where you're on all fours, and you kind of bring your, bring your leg around all the way in a wide, big circle, nice and slow. I can only do about five of those before I'm really burning. Um, obviously, each side, or a hip bridge, right, where you're just raising your hips when you're laying on the ground. Uh, let's go back to chest here. A lot of people don't think they need to exercise their upper body if they're worried about backpacking or running or whatever it is. But I think it is important to just have an overall strong body, especially when you're backpacking, because you're going to have a backpack up here. So you want some shoulder strength, and you want, you want to be somewhat robust up here so you can handle the, the backpack and the twists and turns. So push-ups are probably the easiest one to do when you're at home with no equipment. So I put that for both of these workouts. For the upper back, this is kind of hard to do at home as well. So if you have a pull-up bar, pull-up bar is going to be good. Again, upper back is going to be super important because you have a backpack on yourself, you know, weighing 30 pounds or more, so you want to be able to support that weight. Uh, what I have been doing, because it's hard to do, it's really hard to do upper back exercises without equipment. So what I've been doing, and this actually makes me fairly sore, is just squeezing my shoulder blades together and then just putting my arms up and down like this. And if you do that, that for about a minute and do that three times, so three minutes total, you will be very sore the next day. So that's kind of how I've been adjusting with that. We got some lower back exercises. I'm a big fan of Superman's. The rule about lower back is if you do on abs, you got to do lower back. Just like if you do upper back, you got to do chest. You want to stay balanced in your life. So um, 
you know, if you're going to do abs, make sure you do some lower back exercises to make sure you're not, you know, becoming a troll and hunching over by getting super tight, strong abs. All right, next up we have calves. So calves, for most people, are neglected in the weight room, but if you are going to be doing a backcountry trip, these are going to be some of your primary muscles to keep in shape. Again, you get your, your um, what's it called, Achilles tendon. That's a, obviously a tendon. You don't want that to have any issues. So when you are doing calf raises, you're strengthening your calf and your Achilles tendon. So you want to make sure you do that. I have toe walks on here. This is where you just get up on your tippy toes and you just walk around. Um, that's going to improve all kinds of like articulating strength in your ankles. And that's going to be important when you're walking up rocky mountain passes or whatever it is. You know, you don't want to roll an ankle again. That would be not a good situation. So we want to have strong ankles. Then we got calf raises over here. That's just obviously lifting yourself up on your calves. And then the often neglected but my favorite muscle to talk about is the anterior tibialis. This is located just on the outside of your shin on the front. If you pull your toes towards your knee, you can actually feel that muscle. And uh, one way you can exercise this at home is if you have a band or any type of rope or resistance, you can just, well, if you have a band, you can just do it by yourself. Maybe wrap it around a chair or something heavier, maybe a table, and then you're going to wrap that band around your toe, and then you just pull your toe towards your knee. Um, if you have a rope or something, you can just resist and just pull on that. This is the muscle that lifts your toe up, and so oftentimes what happens when you're backpacking or doing whatever is you start to get tired at the end, and this muscle starts to get fatigued, and then you're walking, and then all of a sudden you don't pick your toe up, you hit a rock, and then you trip. So we want to make sure that we're strengthening our anterior tib. This can also help prevent um, shin splints, so if you struggle with that, strengthening the anterior tib, it's just that muscle again right alongside the shin bone, and that'll just add some durability, some strength to that shin bone, so it's just not the bone taking out the impact, you get a muscle there kind of helping you out. So when it comes to strength, if we're defining strength, strength is how much you can actually lift in like one lift, so your maximum strength. And for most people, you just need to do general weightlifting or general resistance training, and then you're going to get stronger and you'll be good, right? We, if we're doing this 3 by 10 that's a pretty solid routine, and if you did this twice a week, maybe three times a week, you'd be a lot better off than doing nothing. But for some people who want to maybe do longer things or get you know really peaked for training, you can uh, do some strength work. So this would be, I mean, and you don't jump right into this. you got to build up to it, and I'm not going to explain the whole process, but to actually maximize your strength, what you're going to be lifting is something that's heavy enough to where you can only lift it three to six times, and then you're going to do that maybe two or three sets. And the reason why maximum strength is important is, let's say you can squat 100 pounds, all right? So if you can squat 100 pounds, that's pretty good, and you know, you'll probably be fine for the most part, but let's say instead you could squat 200 pounds. So now you've doubled your strength. What that means is when you're walking, especially with a pack on, you are now lifting, you know, before maybe you were really struggling, you're at your capacity when you're backpacking here. Now you've doubled your strength, so now it is literally half, it's half as hard as it used to be when you're walking. So I am a fan of increasing strength, but for most people they don't have the background or the base to actually be able to lift this hard, and you got to kind of work into it, do some hypertrophy phases and stuff. So. For the general population, this will work, and I'll let you figure out this stuff um, later. I have some other videos that I teach you how to um, do some weightlifting stuff, so you can check those out. And then specific training again, hiking with that backpack is going to be good because all those little ligaments and tendons and all the weird little connectors that are holding your backpack up, you're going to want to do practice those and strengthen those before you actually go backpacking because you might be neglecting some little things up here that the backpack is going to stress. So make sure you're doing that specific training. Okay, we are getting close. Let me answer some questions and then I'm going to get to the weekly schedule and then we will do nutrition and we'll be good. So let's see here. We have, okay, we have the diet and I'll get to that. So adding like ankle weights and wrist weights can add some benefit. Uh, yeah, potentially. Um, personally, I think the resistance is quite low, so it will make you slightly stronger. I would rather spend my time working hard in the weight room and lifting lots of weight rather than putting on ankle weights and wrist weights, but they're, they're not going to hurt, that's for sure, and they, they'll provide some benefit, but it'll be minimal, so 
Uh, if they're annoying you, then I wouldn't wear them. If they, if you like them and you enjoy it, then go for it. So, how far in advance should you start training for backpacking trip? Good question. So, let me actually grab another sheet and answer that question. So, if we're talking about like traditional training sense, like if I'm training for something very important to me, I'm going to take 12 to 20 weeks. Now, that seems a little ridiculous, and I kind of agree. You don't need to do specific training for backpacking, but you should have like eight weeks of just general base training before you start doing like HIIT workouts or really hitting it hard with like some strength workouts in the gym. So for most people, if you're just maintaining your fitness overall, which is, uh, well, just staying healthy, if you are exercising 150 minutes of cardio, and two resistance workouts per week, you'll be maintaining your health and overall you'll be able to backpack fairly well. But how, um, if you add some HIIT workouts to this and maybe a little bit higher intensity strength after those eight weeks, so maybe you do this for eight weeks and then you're like, okay, I'm going to do something fairly intense. I want to be as prepared as possible. Then I would go into a four to eight week phase of HIIT and strength training. So you know, somewhere between 12 to 20 weeks. Doing high intensity interval training really kind of caps out your benefits after about 12 weeks. So training really hard for more than 12 weeks isn't going to do a whole lot for you. You need to recover. It's almost too long without taking a couple weeks recovery afterwards. So that's kind of my recommendation for how long. Not a direct answer, but as close as I can get without knowing what your situation is. So Okay, uh, let me ask a few more here. We got, uh, can you train your muscles to fatigue slower rather than being fast acting and tiring quicker? Great question. So when I was talking about this increasing your max strength, so there's two theories on this. One is that if you lift low weight and high reps in the weight room, you're going to be training muscular endurance, which yes, that's true. You will increase your muscular endurance. But to be honest, and you can do this if you enjoy the type of training, I'm not a huge fan and I don't think it's the most effective. So in my opinion, when I'm doing HIIT training or doing cardio, because I do plenty of that, I have enough endurance in my overall program. So what I'm trying to do in my program, since I'm getting enough endurance over, you know, in my other life, is that I'm trying to maximize my strength. So think about this again. Let's say we have a challenge and you are go the challenge is the squat. Oh. Challenges to squat 50 pounds as many times as possible, right? And let's say you have somebody who can squat 100 pounds 10 times, right? But they can't squat 200 pounds. And then let's say you have somebody who can squat 200 pounds at least one time. They can probably squat 100 pounds 15 times or more, probably more than that. And so this person who has a higher overall strength is going to win this challenge of who has, who can squat lower weight more times, which in my opinion would suggest that they have more muscular endurance. So that's why I'm a fan of really peaking our strength for this because I think it reduces fatigue overall. So great question. Okay, when, where in Idaho is a good location for a beginning backpacker? Oh, um, well, the, uh, what do you call them? The Sawtooth Mountains are obviously a classic. If you haven't been there, they're like two and a half hours away. You got to go see the Sawtooth Mountains. When I first saw them, I had to pull over because they're just jagged and awesome. Uh, if you want some low-key places, well, it used to be low-key. The White Cloud Mountains, they're just right across the highway from the, from the Satus. Those used to be super low-key. Um, the Pioneer Mountains are my favorite. Not the best backpacking wilderness because they don't get super deep and you can drive into them quite far, but the Pioneer is definitely underrated. Um, the Seven Devils Wilderness, oh yeah. That's a good place. Seven Devils Wilderness, great hiking, good location, uh, not very many people. Yeah, so there's, there's some good suggestions for you on that. Okay, let's talk about how you lay this out in your week. So for just general health, again, we have this, these guidelines here. And if you do these guidelines, you can be pretty prepared for backpacking. So let's just say Monday you do some easy cardio, 30 minutes. That could be walking your dog, riding your bike to work going for a jog, maybe carrying your backpack, you know, out in the foothills, whatever you want to do. And you, you can obviously rearrange this however you want. 
let's say Tuesday you do a high intensity interval session, right? So you're going hard, getting lots of benefit. If you are working harder, if you're doing high intensity cardio, you only need 75 minutes. So what we're doing with this plan is we're kind of com uh, combining these. And so um, I would think about introducing HIIT training. And just to correct what I said before, when I was talking about this base phase and not doing HIIT before the base phase, in my opinion, you can do some HIIT training before you're out of your base phase. I wouldn't worry about that too much because spiking your heart rate is good overall. But uh, sometimes I get in the track of thinking about like training for track, training for cross country, and that's typically what we do there. But you can do HIIT training year-round, and you probably should be spiking your heart rate fairly consistently. So... You could combine that day with a resistance training workout, right? Just one of these at home. So you can take a screenshot of that. Keep those. I like these workouts. Wednesday, let's say, you work hard, you're lazy, you take the day off. Um, Thursday, another easy cardio day. Maybe another resistance training day there. Friday, maybe just hit another hit workout. You're in the foothills. You find a hill. You go run up the hill a couple times, right? Three by 30 seconds. You can get as creative as you want or six by 30 seconds. 4 by 45 seconds, 5 by 1 minute, you get the idea. Then maybe Saturday you want to put your backpack on and go hike, uh, get used to the backpack, the weight, all that stuff. I would gradually build up the weight. The first time you put on your backpack, you're going to get quite sore. And then maybe Sunday you take it off, you can take another hike. Maybe just hike without the backpack this day with pack. We could even add another resistance training day here. So you can get as fancy as you want with that, but that's just kind of a good general layout. All right, now we got one more here, nutrition. So this is a good topic, and we had a question about this. Let me double check. Best kind of diet. So best diet, in my opinion, uh, there is no best diet. So whatever works well for you, which is kind of a cop-out answer, I know. Uh, there have been studies done with high-fat diets versus high-carb diets. If you're training at a high level, especially for intense activities, the high carb diet does tend to win although there is maybe some limited evidence that a high fat diet if somebody adjusts to it might be just as beneficial but i haven't seen a whole lot of evidence for that with a high fat diet you will start burning more fat um, so you could make a case for that but to be honest i don't really think it matters as long as you're eating as long as you're avoiding high sugar that should be the best for your health and so for backpacking I don't think there is really a best diet necessarily. So maybe high fat because you could burn more fat, but I don't subscribe to that fully. I do eat a, diet, a fat higher or a diet higher in fats, but you know a high fat diet is hard to maintain because you have to eat so much fat, and I I'm just not convinced it's the healthiest for everybody. But it does work for some people. So let's uh, talk about during your hike. So when you're hiking, you're using sugar and glucose and you're, along with fat. So you're always burning everything. Uh, but what happens is you have blood sugar. And as your blood sugar gets lower, your muscles, let's just draw a little muscle here, starts to release uh, glucose into your bloodstream for you to start using. And so as it's releasing this blood glucose, your blood glucose is dropping, you're starting to deplete your muscle stores. And you don't want to deplete your muscle stores because then one of the things that cause fatigue is reducing glucose stores. And so you can support this by actually eating sugar when you are hiking. And you can have bars, um, you know, pre, um, what am I trying to say, M&Ms, uh, gels, bread, peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you can eat all kinds of stuff, but just something with sugar in it. And what I would recommend for hikers is 100 calories per hour. Per hour. So what you're doing with that is you're just trying to prop up your blood sugar so that you're not having to expend so much muscle glucose and use that. So instead you're just eating a little bit of sugar so that you can actually utilize it um, while you're hiking. And that'll just theoretically reduce fatigue. Uh, when I'm going really hard in the mountains, I'll eat 100 calories every 30 minutes. Or, yeah, every 30 minutes. So that would be 200 calories per hour. You can actually train yourself to absorb more calories. At base, everybody can absorb about 100 calories during exercise of sugar. Uh, you can train yourself to get up to 300 calories. And so when I train for ultra marathons, I take a lot of sugar and I take 100 calories in every 20 minutes. So that's what you can do to support your, um, 
your blood sugar. You can add some protein and some fat to that. That wouldn't be the worst idea, you know, like some chocolate milk. Well, that's not really a backpacking food, but nuts, seeds, that kind of stuff, those are going to be higher in fat. They still have carbs, so that all works, some trail mix there. But I would just continuously snack. You want to have those available when you're backpacking. In terms of water goes, uh, you want to drink when you're thirsty. So drink when thirsty. Um, that should keep you up to date most of the time. Uh, thirst is a pretty good indicator of when you need to drink. Although when you are working hard, especially in the heat, you might need to drink more often. So you want to try to stay on top of your hydration so you don't get dehydrated. The best way to tell if you're dehydrated is your urine color. So if it's really dark, brown, and nasty, that means you need to start drinking some water more, right? Um, so you just have to, you know, learn how your body is, make a judgment on that because when it's hotter out, you know, I mean, sometimes even when it's not hotter, people get lulled into a sense of not being thirsty. So you do want to be drinking water. What I do, because you are, when you're digesting this sugar, you want some water to be able to mix with that sugar so you can actually absorb it better. And so anytime I eat food, I'm drinking water. So that's a good rule. When you eat your sugar um, every hour, make sure you're drinking at least then. And I sometimes eat a little more when I'm really working hard. And so then I'm drinking a lot more. So just stay up to date on your water when you're doing that. You know, you don't need to go crazy. You don't need to drink too much. Another tip, that's an interesting, another tip I have is if you don't want to carry all of your water because water is heavy, I will throw down like my analogy and I'll chug the whole thing first before I go get some water in my stomach and then I'll throw my bottle in and then I'll take off. So I'm like storing one bottle already in my stomach. So that's a good little tip for you. All right, last section here and then I'll get to your final questions. So make sure you ask those if you have them. For total calories, when you're hiking, let's say you're doing 10 miles a day. Maybe that's extreme. Maybe it's not, but it's a good round number. You're going to be burning about 100 calories per mile. So that's not always the case. If you're walking uphill, you're going to burn more calories. Let's draw a little hill there. You're going to burn more calories. If you have a heavy backpack on, you might burn a little bit more. But it's going to be about 100 calories per, per mile. So that means you're going to burn 1,000 calories just on your hike. If you look at the rest of your calories, you have your basal metabolic rate. Again, that is how many calories you burn on a daily basis. That is anywhere between 12,000 or 1,200 and 2,000. And then you have just being sedentary. So just being alert and awake is going to burn an additional two to 300 calories, maybe two to 400 calories. Plus, you got to set up your tent and a bunch of stuff. So if we start adding this up, you know, you're looking at 3,400 calories, maybe, up, maybe upwards of 4,000 for some people. And down on the low end, you're looking at 22, 2,400 calories. And that's quite a lot of calories to be carrying because calories are heavy. Oh, there we go. Calories are quite heavy. So one of the keys to uh, decreasing your pack uh, carry is actually to increase the fat in your, um, in your supplies. And nuts, seeds, uh, legumes. Yeah, not so much legumes, but you get the idea. Nuts and seeds, yeah, I guess some legumes. Um, these are fairly light, and they have lots of calories in them. So one gram of fat has nine calories. And if we're looking at one gram of carbs or protein, you're only going to have four calories. So what this means is gram is how much you're carrying, right, and weight. And so Fat is going to be two times as calorie dense. So one of the things that I do when I'm trying to go light and go for a long time is I find high fat foods to eat out there, along with some sugar to support my daily hikes, right? Some M&Ms maybe. Um, gummy bears. I'm a big fan of gummy bears on hikes, mostly because I get them for Christmas. But um, so yeah, so you want to for your like meals and stuff, you're going to have dehydrated meals, but you can also bring some nuts and seeds and trail mix stuff because they're going to be very calorie dense and you want calorie density when you're out there hiking. So, all right, I will answer questions and then we will wrap this up. So, uh, where are we? What kind of diet would you rec- Yeah, okay, good. So we got the diet question. I have heard uh, people taking gel packs with them. Is that just pure glucose? So it's not actually pure glucose. Uh, and I'm going to probably mess this up, but it is, if I had to go off of memory, I think it is 70% glucose and then maybe 30% sucrose. 
and I haven't looked into this for a long time, but there's different types of sugars and they absorb through different pathways. And it turns out that you can absorb glucose at the same time as sucrose. And so, and I believe those are the correct ones. Um, and so if you, with most of those gels, they are made because they know this, and uh, that they are able to uptake those to, through two different channels. So yeah, gels are really good. Most of the time I don't want to pay for the expensive gels. So I just, uh, you know, I'll just bring random sugar. Like I said, like, uh, I get these gummy bears from Germany, and um, they're really good actually, and they just have, I don't even know what kind of sugar it is. It's sugar, and I'm not too intense on everything, so that works. If I'm doing a, like a, a comp competition, like an ultra marathon, then I'm definitely getting the correct gel where I'm getting both absorption uptakes. So good question there. And we got to our last question. How many miles per day is a typical goal distance for backpacking? Oh, see, I am a bad person to ask that question, too, because I tend to overdo things. Um, so I think just whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, sometimes I think people bite off way more than they can chew for a backpacking trip and end up just having a terrible time and really destroying themselves. So if we're thinking about how many miles per day, uh, I, would, I would, like, in your training, go for a four-mile hike, right, to start with your backpack on, see how it goes. You know, next time, go for a six-mile hike see how that goes and then you know I think probably six to eight is fairly typical um, miles you know and I tend to get carried away and sometimes I go on for like you know 10 to 20 miles a day uh, but that's not realistic for a lot of people so and I tend to go really light so the heavier pack is the less you can go so I do like carrying a light pack although you gotta make sure you have what you need um, but yeah, probably six to eight miles per for is an average day. Um, and if you're trying to train up to that, I would just slowly build up to that through training. You know, maybe even start with a two mile walk and a three mile walk. You know, slowly build your way up. And if you have your plan, I would try to do one hike maybe maybe two to three weeks out. Uh, two to three weeks out from your backpacking trip. I would try and get your farthest day hike in. I mean, assuming that it's not ridiculous. You know, if you're going to try and hit like a 20 or a 30 mile day, you probably don't need to do that two to three weeks out. But if you're doing like eight miles, maybe 10 miles, try it out, see how your body fares, and then give yourself two to three weeks to recover from that. So, you know, you're not limping around and stuff. And obviously you need to build up to that slowly. So, all right, we have another question here. What kind of health benefits come from adding weight to your pack? like rucksacking opposed to normal backpacking hike. Well, you're carrying more weight, so uh, I guess your legs will get more of a workout. In my opinion, it's not worth it because then I can't go as fast, and I, I like going fast. So I don't, you know, some people really like to add a, a lot of weight. In my opinion, the only reason to add more weight is if you are training for an event where you are going to add more weight. Uh, some people like to walk with the, with the weight vests on. Again, I'm just not a huge fan of that. Uh, I think it adds a lot of stress to your joints that's unnecessary. And, um, yeah, unless you're trying to, you know, you have a 30-pound weight vest and that feels better than your backpack, you know, maybe you can train that way and just get used to it. But in my opinion, I wouldn't try to overdo your pack weight just to prepare for a lighter pack weight on a, on a trail. I would rather spend my time in the weight room, and I think that would prepare you more for a heavy pack than, like, adding 30 pounds extra to your pack and walking with that. So, yeah, that's my opinion there. All right, well, good questions. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Thanks for coming by. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Or if you have any new video suggestions, leave those in the comments below because I'm going to start making some of these. So, all right, thanks for coming, and I'll see you guys later.